Good morning, K5 Kids. It is glad, I'm glad to be here, and I hope you are glad to join us this morning and study another great Bible lesson. And we're going to uh, study this morning, how do we know that God loves us, or how do we know that God loves you? But let's start with a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us as your children, even though we're stinkers sometimes and we're rebellious, rebellious, and you still continue to love us. And we just say thank you. Thank you for supplying the needs that we have in so many wonderful ways. Uh, we need your help this morning as we look into your word. So may your spirit teach us the things that we need to learn and help us do the things that we need to do. And we thank you in Jesus' special name. Amen. I hope you have your Bibles and uh, the lesson sheets from the website. And, uh, and if you're ready, take your Bibles. Let's go to Judges chapter 6. And let me give you just a little bit of a review. Uh, God gave the Israelites a brand new country, a brand new land, a promised land that he had promised you. And life was good. Everybody had enough. Everybody had plenty of everything. And life was just good. But over a period of time, the people forgot about God. And they started worshiping other idols and other gods. And God would let them go for a while. And then God would discipline them by sending uh, an enemy into their land. And then the people would cry out. And as they cried out, God would hear their cry. And then God would uh, find a man or a woman, and he would deliver the Israelites from the hands of the enemy. And this was the cycle for the entire book of Judges. And that lasted for about 300 years. So everything was good. Everything, everybody had everything and they worshiped God and then they had all these things that they forgot about God. Then God allowed the enemy to come in and make their life miserable so they would turn back to God and they would cry out to God and then God would send them a deliverer and they would be delivered from their enemy. And at that point, uh, it goes back to the beginning of the cycle. What I want to... What we want to do today is uh, talk about one of these men who was the deliverer, or as the Bible calls them, they were judges, and that's why we're in the book of Judges. So there were 13 different men and one woman who were the deliverers. They were the judges, and they delivered Israel from their enemies. And this one man that we're going to look at, we can study about him in, jo in Judges chapter 6 through 8, and his name is Gideon. And Gideon's a great story, and that is what we're going to look at today. But I want to start out and read just a couple of the first couple of verses. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There's that spiral effect. It started going downhill again. Everything was good. They worshiped God, and then they forgot God, and then they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of the Midianites was so oppressive the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. So they, the, the Midianites and the Amalekites were so many of them, and they came into the land that they lived in caves, they lived in strongholds in the mountains. And not only that, but they came in and they would steal all their crops at the end of the harvest season. They'd come in, they'd take their cattle and they'd take their sheep and they'd take their goats and they, rav they ravished the land. They took everything that the Israelites had. So after seven years of suffering under the hands of the, the, Midian, the Midianites and the Amalekites, they cried out to God and God heard their cry. But he didn't send a warrior or judge right off the bat. He send, sent them, in this case, a judge. Or excuse me, he sent them a prophet. And the prophet was to show them or tell them what is going on. And the prophet says, hey, you guys, I want you to remember. I want you to remember what's going on. So in verse 8, if you have your Bible, there in, in Judges 6, 8, he sent them a prophet, not a warrior, not a judge, but he sent them a prophet at this point, and he, who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. 
I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whom in whose land you live, but you have not listened. So God says, hey, I did all these things for you, and I asked you just to serve me, follow me, trust in me, but they did not listen. So God allowed the enemy to come in and make their life miserable. Now, why would God say something like this? Well, I'll tell you what. God is more interested in the heart than he is in the physical things that go on around us. So the enemy, even though they were the the Midianites and the Amalekites, God says, I want you to have a heart check. Something that's really important that God wants is a relationship with the Israelites. He wants them to put him first He wants them to to know that he's the one who takes care of them. He wants them to know that God is their heavenly father. But now that they had forgotten that, they are in a quandary. And God says, hey, remember what's important in life. Remember what's going on. You know, sometimes your mom or your dad, they discipline you. They, they have consequences for, for you when you do something wrong. And the Bible calls that discipline. Did you know that discipline is a way that, that you know that your mom and dad love you? That's, this, this is what's in our story this morning God loved the Israelites, and so he disciplined them. He wants them to change the way they think and their character and their lifestyle in order that they would follow after God because God knows, God knows that following him brings the greatest joy and peace to our life. But the Israelites, they didn't see that. They got going off and doing their own thing. So the reason that you may get punished, and the reason that I get punished is because God loves us. And for you, your parents love you. Your parents want you to, to think like Jesus, to act like Jesus. They want you to have a godly character. And they know if they, if they punish you for your rebellious acts of not obeying or not doing what you're supposed to do, that punishment helps you decide to maybe I shouldn't do that anymore and I should develop my character to be more like what God wants me to be or like Jesus would want me to be. So growing up, when you get in trouble and you have consequences, mom and dad actually love you and they want you to follow after Jesus. That's how you know whether your parents love you or not, is because they discipline you. Same thing with Israel. In the the verse that we have here, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12, it says God disciplines those that he loves. And that's what God does here to the Israelites. That's what God does, uh, does for many of the different people who walk away from God. He allows things to come into his life. And the reason that he does that is because he loves them. Well, the Israelites had been, had been uh, punished for seven years. They're ready to follow the Lord again. They've had the consequences. They're ready to get going again. So God goes to Gideon and he says, you're the man for the job. I want you to deliver your people, the, your people, the Israelites, from the Midianites. And I love what verse 16 says because, you know, Uh, Gideon, he goes, I'm not your man. I'm just a weenie. I'm just the smallest of my family. My my tribe is just a little tribe. We have no power. We have no superstars. 
But God said something that's extremely important. In verse 16, it says, I will be with you. Wow. Gideon, you don't have to worry about whether you have all the, the, the battle strategies. You don't have to worry about being able to be the strongest person. You don't have to worry about uh, how to divide the tribes up. You don't have to worry about the, the plan to defeat the enemy. God says, I will be with you. You know, that sounds a lot like what God told Abraham. He says, I'll be with you. Go down into that new land. When he came to Moses and, and uh, he says, Moses, I want you to go deliver my people from, from, uh, from Pharaoh. And Moses says, I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. I'm a nobody. And God says, I'll be with you. And he said the same thing to Joshua. Joshua, you're the man to go into that uh, promised land to defeat all these enemies. And Joshua goes, oh, I don't know. And God says, I'll be with you. Do you know what it's like when God says to you, I'll be with you? I don't know what kind of fears you have. Maybe it's you're afraid of the dark, you're afraid of changes, you're afraid of what's going to happen in school next. You're just all antsy. But all you have to remember is that God loves you and God will be with you no matter what. Well, God came to Gideon and says, Gideon, you know, you're the man that I'm going to use to deliver the Israelites uh, from the enemy of the Midianites, the Amalekites. You're the man. And Gideon goes, God, is it you who's really talking to me? Or is this just somebody else? Or is this really you? Are you really going to defeat the Midianites and the Amalekites? And Gideon says, wait right here. And so he runs and he gets a goat. He makes some bread and some gravy. He comes back. He lays it out before the angel of the Lord. And the angel says, put it on a rock. Put it right there. And so Gideon put all that right there. And the angel of the Lord took his staff and he touched it. And it went poof. It just was gone. That was a verification That was a proof to to Gideon that God is calling him to do as he said he wanted him to do. So now we have, but Gideon wasn't quite satisfied yet. He wanted to know more. So he says, okay, he says, let's take the lamb's wool and let's take a little bit of water. And uh, overnight, I want you to make the lamb's wool really, really dry. And, uh, and all around the lamb's wool, I want it to be, can you make it really, really wet? So God did it. Well, Gideon wasn't quite sure yet. So he says, okay, this time, can you just make the lamb's wool dry, makes the lamb's wool and the water and just reverse the, make it exactly the opposite. And that's exactly what happened. God was going to tell Gideon, you're the man for the job. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you, and you just trust me. Well, Gideon rallies the army then, and he has 32,000 soldiers that come. But God had something really, really interesting that he wanted uh, Gideon to understand. And in, in Judges chapter 7, verse 2, It says this, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands or Israel will boast and say, we, because of our own strength, we have saved ourselves." And God says, I want the Israelites to know that I saved you and not the men, the fighting men of Israel the children of Israel. So there was over 135,000 enemy. And that's what this represents right here. We have 135,000, not literally, but that gives you an idea of the enemy. And we have in this container, we have 32,000 of the Israelites. And God says, too many Too many, I don't want them to have to say that they defeated the enemy. I want everybody to know that I did it. 
So through a process of a couple different things, so everybody who was just afraid, he told Gideon, send them home. So thousands of them, thousands of them went home. And God says, well, you have still too many. So God says, take them down to a, let them drink some water. And by how they drink will determine who stays and fights and who goes home. So after it was all said and done, after it was all said and done, there was only 300, there was only 300 soldiers left. Just 300. That was it. Well, how could that possibly be? How can 300, 300 soldiers defeat an army of 130,000 plus? How can that be possible? Well, and not only the odds are so crazy, but it's, the, it's by what the weapons that, that God told Gideon to get for each of these 300 soldiers. Now, you've heard of a ram's horn. Where does a ram horn come from? It comes from a ram or a sheep. And when the sheep would die, they'd cut the horn off, and then they would hollow that horn out, and they'd make a horn out of it or like a trumpet out of it. So they found 300 ram's horns. The other thing they were supposed to get was 300 torches. So they probably went around looking for torches. And again, the torches are probably about this long. They probably wrap some cloth, something around the end, and they put something on there, and they light that on fire so it burns for a long time. So they needed torches. And the other thing they needed was clay jars. Have you ever imagined going in to do a battle with a ram's horn, a torch, and clay jars? That's unheard of. And then you're outnumbered 300 to 130,000 plus. That is unbelievable odds. But Gideon was told to go down to the enemy camp and God made sure that Gideon heard the interpretation of a dream. And after Gideon heard the interpretation of this dream, he knew that God was going to deliver these, these Midianites and the Malachites into their hands and that Gideon and his 300 men would win. But how is that going to happen? How is that going to happen? Well, this week, I would like you to sit down around the table, maybe during dinner time or breakfast time, and read how God delivered the children of Israel out of the hands of the Midianites and the Amalekites. Open up the Bible, maybe pass it around, but find out for yourself how God defeated this incredible, vast army, 130,000 plus, with ram's horns, with torches, and with, with uh, clay jars, and 300 men. God can do some amazing powers. So you find out the rest of the story. You check it out and see for yourself what it's all about. Let's review just for a second. God disciplines and punishes people that he loves. And that applies to you, and that applies to me, and that applies to uh, everybody around us. Your parents love you, and they discipline you so that you would develop the character of Jesus. The other thing I'd like us to, to know is about the Bible promise. In Psalms 34, 17, it says this, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. See, whether we're being, being dis disciplined, whether we're being punished, God still can hear our cry for help. He still hears and he'll still deliver us. But sometimes there's a lesson that he wants us to learn. Sometimes there's a character flaw that he wants us to change in our life. Or maybe we got a problem with pride and we think we're just too good. Or maybe we lie just too much. Or, or maybe we say things we shouldn't say. And we're punished for those things. But you know, God knows all about that and he's there to help you. He's there to help change you. And the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. That is a promise for God. So we are loved by God. We are loved by our parents.
parents, our parents love us. And they discipline us because they want us to become more, more like Jesus. And God loves us and he helps us through all these difficult times. You know, I was talking to a, a gal the other day and she, she, was a, she was a seventh grader. And I says, well, how is your week going? And she says, oh, she goes, I'm a little bored. And I said, well, why are you bored? There's all kinds of things that you can do. She goes, well, um, I can't do any screen time anymore. And I go, oh, well, why can't you do any screen time anymore? And she told me, she says, well, I, I lied to my brother and I got caught. So my punishment was that I couldn't have any screen time for two weeks. And I go, oh, I see. But do you think that your mom loves you because she disciplined you? And so we had a little bit of a conversation right there. God loves those he disciplines. And your parents love you when they discipline you because they want to build character in your life. So this week, read the story of the rest of the story of Gideon. And then next week, we're going to look at another judge. And this man, this judge was known for his muscle. And that's what we're going to study next week. So let's have a word of prayer as we close. God, thank you for this great story. Thank you that you love those whom you discipline. Thank you that you're in the midst of all that and you're making character and you're developing godly character. So thank you. Help us to do the right things. Help us to live for you and help us to make the choices that you want us to do. And thanks for being with us. Thanks for helping us. And we love you and we give you great thanks. In Jesus' special name, amen. You have a good week. I'll see you next Sunday. Well, you're probably opening this YouTube uh, teaching on Friday or Saturday. At least that's the goal. And a few things before we get dived into the message for this teaching. Just an update so you're, everyone's aware, you know, what's the church doing? What are we thinking? How are we navigating through this situation? I think a few just exciting things I want to share. Uh, one, as you saw in your e-news this week, that we're moving towards home church communities. These are both uh, formal in the sense that we've got leaders in place and people that we're working with and ongoing training, weekly touch points. And so we want to have those available so 25 people or less can gather in these home church communities, which is going to be great. But they can also be informal. And what I mean by that is you might say, I don't, I don't want to go to a, a situation that feels maybe a little bit less controlled. So if you want to uh, host your own home church gathering by inviting a family over, inviting a friend over, um, inviting someone from the church over, and you don't want to open that up to 25 people, we really want to encourage you to be thinking about community right now and taking the steps that you can take within your uh, personal situation to have that kind of connection with people. Um, the other thing is we're hoping that these teachings that we're going to be bringing through YouTube, the kids teaching, the worship. We, we hope they can be tools for people that are going to those home communities. So watch these on Friday and Saturday so you can come to your home community um, on Sunday ready to contribute. The last thing I want to mention is if you're uncomfortable with any of those uh, solutions, and right now it's like, hey, home church is me, my family, my dog, and YouTube, I want to say that that is okay. That is, a, uh, that is a fine solution and would just encourage you to stay connected through phone calls, text messages, and those sorts of things. So during our meet and greet, here's what I'd like you to do. Instead of saying, it's Sunday morning, I'm going to text somebody I miss, hopefully you're watching this on Friday and Saturday, I, I, I would encourage you to take a few minutes right now and prayerfully think about a few people that you want to invite to a home church community, one of the groups that are going to be meeting. Um, the last thing too is if you are watching this meet and greet and you go, man, I want to host one and I want to be a leader, please reach out to us. We want to get you in the leadership pipeline. We're having ongoing leadership trainings and those sorts of things. So go ahead and take a few minutes and respond, and then we will dive into the message this morning.
Hey church, one thing I wanted to mention too was as we uh, celebrate Memorial Day this coming Monday, just an awesome opportunity to be thankful for the place we get to live, to be thankful for the men and women who serve our country, and just to be cognizant that as Christians, we really are dual citizens, both of the kingdom of God, and then we, we live out that citizenship in a place where God's placed us, and that place is the United States of America, it's Central Oregon, it's sisters, and to be thankful for the ways that God has allowed us to experience freedom in our country and to serve others. So this, take some time and just be thankful for the place we get to live in and be cognizant and thoughtful and prayerful about how you can be, continue to be a part of the solution to, uh, to continue to live in the wonderful freedoms we enjoy. Thanks. Hey, good morning, Vast Church. Welcome. We're so glad you guys have joined us this morning. Hey, let's worship together. Let's pray. God, we just declare, Lord, from our hearts that you are worthy of our praise. God, you are worthy of our worship. God, you are worthy of our hearts and our souls, God. So we surrender everything to you this morning, God. Lord, whether we come in this, in this place with a heavy heart, burden, God, or God, we're rejoicing, Lord. We know that you are here with us. God, even though we're in separate spaces, Lord, we know your spirit is here with us, God. Lord, we just declare that we are hungry for you. God, we desire your presence. God, we declare that there's no place we would rather be than in your presence, God. So we sing you these songs now, Lord, not just with our lips, but with our hearts and every ounce and every inch of who we are, God. We love you, Lord, and we sing you these songs now. In Jesus' name. Sing this together. We are sea of voices. We are an ocean of your praise. Gathered under one name. We are the sun that's rising. And we cannot be contained. Gathered under one name. Oh, for a Triumph 
and I can breathe. I am here. I am free. Here's my heart, Lord. And here's my heart, Lord. Here's my
again just sing here's my heart Lord sing it from your heart to God an absolute surrender to him his will his way say together, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, have your way. Lord, as we um, are scattered as the church right now, we're thankful, God, that we have a spot and spaces and yards and backyards and homes and hosts and people that want to connect. And I pray, God, that as we hear the, the word, that it would richly um, energize the church in ways that we have not been energized. God, for what's dormant and what's um, asleep within our church body, just wake it up by the power of the Spirit. That's what this passage is about. Help me um, for, uh, after a long week with lots of um, opportunities and meetings and people, help me, God, tonight to open the Word so that there'd be a, a ripple effect that would multiply in men and women's hearts and in children's hearts. And, and that we would truly be a church that really shapes our community with this countercultural presence, the presence of Jesus, the presence of the spirit, the presence of the father represented through the church. Amen. So we're talking for the last couple of weeks about the church and that's just the direction we're going to be going and this morning's message is from Acts 1 and 2. We're going to be looking at the birth of the church. And, and the, the kind of the, the cliffhanger of last week is Acts chapter 1, verse 4. He says, do not depart, but wait. I'm going to do something. And the, the, the picture that's um, unfolding in the passage this, this morning is the idea of something is being born. So God is birthing a new uh, embodiment of his work in the world. He's going he's gonna to keep his covenant promise of Ezekiel 36. He's going to write the law of God on human hearts. Jeremiah 31, he's going to give him a new heart. In Acts 2, Peter's going to quote the, the prophet Joel, and he's going to say that that prophecy that we've read about, it's happening among us. And this idea of the church being born is actually the very same metaphor that Jesus used in John 16 when he talked about the giving of the Holy Spirit. He, uh, if you remember this famous teaching when this, that Jesus had about the Spirit, he says to the church, to his disciples, he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. And then he says, you're not gonna, for a little bit while, longer and you, you're, then you're not going to see me. And then after a little while, you're going to see me. And he says that you're going to have sorrow, but your sorrow's going to turn to joy. And then he says, just like a mother, just like a woman who's pregnant, who has sorrow for a moment, but is birthing out this new life. And so this Acts 1 and 2 picture is prophesied in the Old Testament, but I would say it's also announced by Jesus himself in John 16. And so let's just lay the groundwork for how the story unfolds. 
Because the goal and the hope of, and the direction that we believe God has us on as a church during this time is not to try and figure out how quickly we can make everything go back to normal. We're looking at this time saying God is doing something and he's birthing something and the spirit of God is, is actually moving in ways that are remarkable. So what does that look like? And he, so here's what it looks like for the early church. Acts chapter one, verse four, the instruction to the disciples is this. He ordered them to the, to the disciples, don't depart from J- Jerusalem, but you guys are to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Wait, power from on high is coming. And of course, the disciples hear that and they have a rebuttal, right? That's a good idea, Jesus. That's a good plan. Um, but, but here's our question, verse six. When they'd come together, they, they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I just want to pause and I want to characterize the disciples two ways with this question. Um, first off, I want to say this is actually a reasonable biblical question. The idea of a king coming who's going to be a king of Israel, who's going to establish the kingdom of God through Israel as a countercultural kingdom on earth, bringing the presence of God and the presence of the, I would just call it the original intent, the, the vision of Eden, the kingdom of God. That is a biblical concept. Uh, Genesis 49 is this prophecy in that there's gonna be a, a son from the tribe of Judah and he's going to rule with a scepter. A scepter is, is what a king wears when they're making royal edicts and they use their scepter. It's a, it's a, it's a symbol of kingship. Second Samuel 7, a key linchpin passage in the Old Testament is Yahweh making a covenant with, with David. And he says that from the line of David, there's gonna be an offspring and he'll have an eternal throne and he will reign and rule righteously forever. And so what I wanna do is I wanna start by just being charitable with the disciples question. And I wanna say, I think it's a good question, right? God, are you doing what you said you were gonna do? But I also wanna be suspicious of this question. So it's not just a reasonable biblical question. It's also a I'll just say a militaristic and political question. Why would they say this? Well, because Rome is the superpower of the day. And there's a guy named Caesar and he's mean and he's mean to Christians and he's mean to the church and the church is pressed. They're crucifying, literally crucifying the enemies of Rome. You mess with Rome, you announce another Lord other than Caesar and you're in trouble. So these guys aren't just thinking biblically. I want to grant that probably some of that was true, but they're thinking politically, militaristically. So they ask the question. It's the, probably the same question that the church has asked forever. How long, O oh Lord, until you fix all this? Like we live in this day that we're living in today. And we see the, we see the evil and we see the tyrants we see the confusion. How many people are confused right now? I'll just volunteer and say, I'm really confused. Like, how do we make sense of the, of the world we're living in in 2020? Is anybody telling the truth, right? God, are you going to restore the kingdom? Have you abandoned the original plan? Fix it. How long, O Lord? That's the question. And here's the Lord Jesus answer to them. He said to them, guys, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. So the answer is, we don't get to know. But better than knowing how and what time and all the timeline, I'm not going to give you a timeline. I'm going to give you something else, verse eight. But you will receive power to be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so the concentric circles look like this, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. You're going to receive power. Why do they need power? Because without the spirit, we're a bunch of wimps that will buckle under pressure. And when we stand before the governors and the kings and the people in high places, we will cower in fear. And that's exactly, that's exactly what Peter does in the gospels. Hey, are you with Jesus? Oh, I don't, I don't know that guy. Oh, I, no, I, I guarantee this guy's with, no, I wasn't with Jesus. Without the spirit, we're wimps. And what I want to say, especially within the, the framework of the book of Acts and the framework of the birth of the church, the spirit's role is to take wimps and make them bold. And we think about the Spirit's work, and we, there's a lot of debate on the gifts of the Spirit. Important discussion. I think it's important to think through how we're gifted. We sh- the fruits of the Spirit, tr- you know, spiritual formation and transformation. But we underdo the role of the Spirit as it relates to public ministry and evangelism. This Holy Spirit's going to take these people that are not bold, that don't think they can flip the empire upside down. And by Acts chapter 17, one of the great uh, recollections of the early church, I I think it's Acts 17. Oh man, fact check me here. Maybe verse six says of the early church, the charge is this. These men flipped the world upside down. You will receive power. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stay. I want you to remain. I want you to stay in prayer. So here's what they do. Verse 12, they return to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet. This is after the ascension, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. And these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So what do they do? They pray. Wait a minute. What is the strategy? (laughs) Prayer. Where's the game plan? Where's the, where, where's the business plan? Where's the marketing budget? Who's running their Instagram profile? Who's doing their social media? The early church was born in hunger for God. The early church was born through longing. The early church was born in desperation. The early church was marked by a profound hunger for God to work. And so we see this early church birthing through prayer. Now, right at the end of chapter one, there's an interesting story. Okay, so it looks like the disciples, they're going the right direction. They've heard Jesus' teaching. Man, it's all good to go. And, And here's what happens. In those days, verse 15, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, brothers, The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, El Kadama, that is field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and oh, let the another take his office. So they've read their scriptures, and Judas acted out his part from the prophetic word, and so they read the other prophecy and let another take his office. So the disciples, what are they supposed to be doing? Waiting, praying waiting to receive the power. They do it until they don't. (laughs) And they decide, 
we better take care of that discipleship issue and that apostle issue. So they just, they cast lots and this guy named Matthias wins and justice gets beat and whatever. And Matthias becomes an apostle. And that story before the day of Pentecost, I just want to mention two things. One, it's a contrast story. Okay. Acts chapter one, verse 14, gather prayer, waiting on God faithful embodiment of discipleship to Jesus. And it's a contrast story to show how tricky this life of discipleship really is. Matthias is never mentioned again in the Bible. I, I'm pretty sure you can fact check me on that. In fact, most theologians say the 12th disciple is a guy that we meet in Acts chapter seven named Saul. Saul. His conversion story is in Acts 9. He becomes Paul. And so Matthias becomes this, this story, this symbol within the book of Acts of they've diverted from waiting and now they're going to go do it. And when they do it, guess what happens? Absolutely nothing. And Luke writes Matthias out of the story. He's written out of the narrative. We don't hear about him again. And it's the silence about his character that tells us everything Luke wants us to think about this interaction. Okay, so faithful embodiment, uh, Acts 1.14, the Matthias narrative, this is human effort kind of stuff. Okay, we're set up for the birth narrative of the church. Here we go. Acts chapter two. When the day of Pentecost arrived, pause right there, Pentecost. What is Pentecost? This is an Old Testament idea. It would be associated with some of their festivals, specifically around harvest. Now think about this. Harvest is the day of reaping. You've labored all winter long. You've, you've weeded through the spring. You've sowed, you've watered. And the miracle of crops is that while we do something, some, there's, a, there's a power outside of us needed to produce any kind of fruit. Nobody can just grow fruit on their own because someone has to provide dirt and someone has to, there has to be a generous God that provides water and there has to be a generous God that, that brings nutrition and, and the, 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 the exact science for these crops to grow. And so this scene takes place on the day of Pentecost. And by the way, the day of Pentecost for us will be in about 12, 13 days here, May 31st. It's 49 days after the resurrection. And so we'll celebrate Pentecost, the birth of the church, the giving of the Holy Spirit. So the, the, the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Um, I want to take just a minute and just, I want to highlight that word, suddenly. Suddenly means that it's, uncaused by human activity. It's miraculous. Suddenly means they were waiting and longing, but they were simultaneously surprised. Um, I still remember one of, my, uh, one of my seminary profs, Laney Hubbard. He's a Pentecostal. He came and did a whole teaching on Pentecostal theology and it was awesome listening to a, a, you know, a really well thought through, th thoroughly doctrinally sound Pentecostal share his theology. And he said something very, very profound to our uh, class of young, naive, zealous seminarians. He said to the group, he says, guys, men and women, he says, if your mission can be done or explained by your ingenuity, by your wisdom, or by your power, then your mission is too small. What happens in this 
birth of the church narrative can't be explained by human power. Not by power, not by wisdom, not by might. It's nothing less than the profound and powerful work of God. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was a preacher during the Great Awakening, one of the greatest revivals, maybe probably the greatest revival that we know, at least in our continental United States. Let me read to you a few of the fruits of revival as he watched the Great Awakening happen in the Northeast. He says, the daily conversation of virtually everyone in the town was revival. He says, other discourses than of the things of religion would scarcely be tolerated in any company. The minds of people were wonderfully taken off from the things of the world and the things of the world were treated amongst us as having very little consequence to our real lives. <laughs> he says there was a virtual neglect of daily affairs. He says what seemed to follow the worldly business more as a part of their duty than any from any disposition they had to it, the temptation now seemed to lie on that hand to neglect worldly affairs and to spend much time in the immediate exercise of religion. He says, the only thing in our view was to get the kingdom of heaven and everyone appeared to be pressing into it. Into it. The engagedness of our whole community, our hearts, this was the great concern and it would not be hidden. It appeared in people's countenances. So I just want to pause and take his old English and translate. He says, the water cooler talk at work was about the kingdom of God. He says, we dismissed our worldly affairs and business and all the things that we thought were important. And everyone was talking about things, he, he would say, things of religion, things of the gospel, things of, of God. And he says, it was so powerful. He says, it showed up in our countenance. It showed up in people's face. He says, here's what happened. There was transformation in worship. Our public praises were greatly enlivened. People were evidently, they wanted to sing with unusual elevation of heart and voice. There was a, a movement towards focus on Christ. The backslidden were restored. Many people came on visits and left and brought that revived spiritual awakening to other towns. There was geographic spreading, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. The spirit comes and God pours out. Now, I want to just put this Acts 2 story within the context of the biblical narrative, and I want to compare it to two very important Old Testament stories. Because uh, Tim Mackey, who, who does, runs the Bible Project, he talks about how the scriptures have what he calls, I, I like this phrase, hyperlinks. And if you're, you know anything about web pages, you can scroll over a word, and, and that word will light up, and then you can hit it, and that word will take you to another web page. And next thing you know, you're going to be doing research on something else. And then you'll find a hyperlink on that page. And next thing you know, I mean, you can start by like Googling best spots to go snorkeling in Kauai. And I think I ended up last time I did this on like the top five places to eat a Philly cheesesteak. Hyperlink, 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 hyperlink. You're out in the middle of nowhere, right? Well, the Bible is the same way. And so this Acts 2 story, is, it's hyperlinked to two critical Old Testament stories. And I want to show you how the birth of the church, the coming of the Spirit, and the inauguration of the new covenant, it's, it's the answer that these two Old Testament stories leave us haunted with. And the first one is the story of Babel. And you'll see a, a slide on your screen right now that kind of diagrams this for us. In Genesis 11, it's this, it's this story of kind of the apex of human rebellion against God. It says in Genesis 11, now the whole earth had one language in the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to, to one another, come, let us make bricks and we'll burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build 
ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So they get new technology, brick and mortar. And that new technology gives them a false sense that we can get to God. And it, it says two things. They wanted to build a city, okay? And the second thing is they wanted to make a name for themselves. And I just want to highlight those two things. The city is about security. The city is about building a community where you think you're untouchable, we're invincible. We're gonna be secure. The tower is about building a name for themselves, okay? And both of these things are a complete violation of the divine mandate of Genesis chapter one. God never told Adam and Eve, go make a name for yourselves. He says, be fruitful and multiply and what? Fill the earth. Don't congregate in a city, fill the earth with what? With the reality of the knowledge of the glory of God. God had already built the city. It was Eden. You know what Babel decided? We want Eden. We just don't want the king. We want the kingdom. We just don't want the king. Does that sound like maybe a culture we might be living in today? We want all the benefits of the kingdom. Just don't give us the king. And so here's what Yahweh God does. The Lord God came down to see the city. And by the way, that's some Bible humor. So just go with me here for a second. Think about this. We're going to build a tower to get to God. And the author of the scriptures tell us, I don't know how far they made it up, but it wasn't very far because God still had to what? Come down. He's ripping on their city. God had to come down to their little three-story high brick building. Oh, that's a cute little building. And so what does God do? He disperses them. In verse seven, let's go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth and they left off their building, the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel because the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. These language confusions are a result of rebellion against God. We'll use our oneness and we'll use it to rebel against God. And God says, um, no, that's, that's actually not the kingdom plan. So the Genesis 11 story is actually a setup for the Genesis 12 call of Abraham. Abraham's calling happens in the spiritual climate of Babel, okay? So the family being, the seed being uh, promised to Abraham, the vision of renewing the Genesis 1 and 2 reality through the seed of Abraham, through Messiah, that promise happens in a Genesis 11 Babel climate. So the languages are confused. Now, here's what happens in Acts 2. Remember, Genesis 11, we will go to God. Acts 2. Suddenly there came from where? From heaven. Babel is, we'll go from earth to heaven. Pentecost is, heaven's coming to earth. Do you see that? And here's what happens. Verse six. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. The confusion of Genesis 11 is being reversed in Acts 2. The confusion of not being able to understand and hear, it's, it's, God is re, he's reversing the Babel curse and the Babel rebellion. One of uh, the theologians, David Lawrence, put it this way. He said, at Babel, God's judge, God judged and restrained rebellion by confusing languages in dividing the people. At Pentecost, God forgives rebellion using various world language, languages to bring people together in Jesus. The effects of sin are being undone as the spirit goes forth with the gospel of God's grace for us in Christ. And so the first story I think we're supposed to think of when we read Acts 2 is the story of Genesis 11. Wow. 
Babel's being redeemed, praise God. But that's not the only Old Testament narrative. The second one you'll see on your screen, it's the Sinai narrative. It's the Exodus 19 and 20. And you'll see some very, uh, very similar language. You'll see at Sinai, you'll see wind, fire, and thunder in Exodus 19. Guess what we have at Pentecost? We have wind, fire, and then it's a little bit further in Acts 4 where it says that the room was shaken, the idea of thunder or movement or boom, right? Um, in, in Exodus 19 and 20, God's presence comes and, and it fills the, the space with, a, it says, a, th- a thick cloud. But look at Pentecost. Uh, it says that, that um, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. God's doing a filling work again. And so in Exodus 19, he, he fills it with his presence via a cloud. And in Pentecost, he's filling now, but he's doing it through the Holy Spirit. In both scenes, we have people. In Exodus 19 and 20, we have the giving of the law. But at Pentecost, we have the giving of the Spirit, the teacher, Jesus called him. At Sinai, we got the law, but it was written on tablets of stone. At Pentecost, he writes his law on tablets of the human heart. In Exodus, you have to go up to the golden calf narrative in Exodus 34, but 3,000 die. But in Pentecost, 3,000 are saved. In Sinai, it's the birth of a covenant nation, Israel. But at, at Pentecost, it's the birth of the new covenant people, the church. And so these two Old Testament question marks Will Babel be redeemed? Will will the Exodus 19 and 20 situation, will that get figured out? Acts 2 is the answer. Yes, it's going to be redeemed. It's going to be renewed. God is putting that plan back together. And so Peter gets up. He preaches a sermon. He quotes from Joel. He quotes from Psalm 16 and other places. But what's hugely important, friends, is that God is actually keeping his covenant word to birth the new covenant people, a people who have been given the spirit. Exodus 37 is a passage that actually prophesied this day. And if you remember Exodus 37, the metaphor that the prophet picks up on is a valley of dry bones where there's death and destruction. It looks like evil has won. And here's, the, here's, the, here's what the scriptures say in Exodus 37, verses 24 and following. He says, my servant David will be king over them and they will have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, that that will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. Acts 2 is the grand birth narrative. This is the moment that God goes to dwell with his people forever. And so church is actually not something we attend. Church is not something that we have a program. Church is not any of those things. Church is the new covenant community. It's the people of God indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the early church creed is actually embedded right in Peter's sermon. It's right there in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, after Peter gives a great 
teaching here. His conclusion is this. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord, sovereign, and Christ, Messiah. This Jesus whom you crucified. And that's the doctrine. That's the, that's the confession of the early church. If you go through the book of Acts, every sermon's going to get there the same way, but they're going to come to those same conclusions. Jesus is both Lord, he's the sovereign God, and he's Christ. He's the Messiah who died for the world. And so now the church, in an ironic way, where it has always been a destination religion, get to the tabernacle, get to the temple, get to the holy place. The new covenant is like, I'm going to drop the tabernacle amongst you and I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to do something different. In fact, in the, in the book of Ephesians, he calls the church the temple. Now we become the dwelling place of God. And so I just want to close by just looking real quick at the description of this early church. And we're going to look at this a little bit today and then a lot next week. So they hear this, some were cut to the heart, some hear this and go, what must I be do to be saved? Some plug their ears and say, tell these guys to shut up. That's kind of how the gospel works when you're sticking it to the powers, okay? Here's, here's what happens. 3,000 were added. Here's what they did. They devoted themselves. They actually committed. This wasn't a consumer relationship. It was a covenant relationship. They devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. The result of that, that's what they did. The result, awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and they were distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending to the temple, corporate, together and breaking bread in their homes. So you have temple, homes, got two locations. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. And they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number every day those who were being saved. Okay, what are we going to do? What, what are we supposed to do in these, in these backyard church meetings? Let's do Acts 2.42. <laughs> Let's just do that. I, I want to close by just telling you a story. Um, I was thinking a lot about this this, this last week. Um, when I was a, a youth pastor at my first church, I was really grateful for the experience. Um, it was old school, just old school youth ministry. Um, and I really am grateful that that's where I started. I remember going to my desk and my, um, my supervisor had printed out, it was probably 50 pages of phone numbers and he, phone numbers and uh, families' names and kids. And he threw it on my desk and said, time to call every one of these kids. And that was what I did. I called every one of these families. I introduced myself. And when you're in youth ministry, one of the fun things is you're not living off of uh, like awesome like funding. You're, you're, you're literally just living off passion. And we had to recruit a team to reach these middle schoolers and high schoolers. And so that's what I did. I went after this group of ragtag folks that, wanted, that really believed that their mission and their ministry to students could change the world. And so I remember going into this, uh, this meeting and truthfully, it was not an impressive group of people. Um, you would look around and go, okay, we've got, uh, yeah, good thing we have the Holy Spirit because that's about all we have. And so we're looking around and I'm, I'm looking at this group and we're talking about reaching students for Christ. And we're talking about, you know, we, we might not have the competency. We might not have all the, all the you know, the socio cool factor going on. Uh, we might not have the, you know, the contextual language of the, the kids, but, but what I, t- I told the team, I said, what we lack and all that, let's make up with, it, with our fire. Let's just make, let's just out pray any of those def- deficiencies because we have a lot. You know what was weird? 
we actually did. Guys, the closest thing I've ever lived to Acts 2.42 was the grit of youth ministry. During that year, it was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't our effort. We couldn't have, couldn't have done it. After one retreat, where I, I, I think 300 kids were there. It was crazy. 100 kids gave their life to Christ, and we baptized 98 of them the next Wednesday night. We had a bunch of nobodies, unskilled, unimpressive, uneducated men, nothing less than the longing of seeing the power of God. And I just want to share one last thing from my heart. I don't want to play church. I don't want to play the market share game. I don't want to play the personal branding game. And I don't want to play the vision game where I come up with good things and, you know, do a song and dance and clown show and juggle and keep everyone, everyone happy. I long to be a part of a church where we are longing for the nothing less than the power of God. Oh God, unless you come, we will fail. And so as you head to your home churches, we're not just there to be nice and greet one another. We're there to care and pray and shepherd and love and admonish and invite and evangelize and serve and be on mission for our community with one another. Let's pray. God, thanks for this text and thanks for giving us the spirit. Thanks for empowering us for your mission. And thank you, God, for what you can do through us, despite us. We're not awesome. We're not strong. We're not impressive. We're here and we're asking you, God, to just come and do your thing in us and through us. In Christ's name, amen. Have a great time at your home church. And if you're watching this Sunday morning with, with just your family, that is awesome too. If there's ways we can serve you as a church, just reach out. Thanks.